Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 30, Arthur Clarke's Comeback. Arthur C. Clarke was one of the big four sci-fi authors in the golden age of the 1950s. I spent quite a bit of time talking about them when we looked at that decade, but I mentioned at the time that none of them just quit writing in the 60s, even though their signature hard sci-fi had become less popular during the new wave. They would take breaks from time to time, but all four of them continued to write new books well into their golden years. In the 70s and 80s, hard sci-fi was gaining popularity again, and with it, the newer works of the Golden Age authors, Asimov's The Gods Themselves, the Second Foundation Trilogy, and the novelizations of Bicentennial Man and Nightfall, Heinlein's Time Enough for Love, The Cat Who Walks Through Walls, and The Number of the Beast. Bradbury, of course, considered himself more of a fantasy writer. These books are still well-read today and would represent a respectable comeback for any author, but Arthur C. Clarke definitely did it the best. Despite their later work, Asimov and Heinlein are best remembered for their early novels, Foundation and I, Robot, Starship Troopers and Stranger in a Strange Land. Yet for Clarke, many of his most beloved books came from this later period of his career. The story begins where we left off, with 2001 A Space Odyssey. Arguably Clark's most famous book, it was released in 1968, at the height of the new wave. And while the book was fairly rigorous, and actually the movie was too, it came out alongside a movie that was very much new wave in style. Whichever way you slice it, 2001 A Space Odyssey was a big hit, and Clark was more popular than ever. As evidence, not too long afterwards, he was offered a three-book publishing deal, which was unheard of for a sci-fi writer at the time. The first book of that deal eventually became another of his big hits, Rendezvous with Rama. And while I can't find a source for it, the other two were presumably Imperial Earth and the Fountains of Paradise. Rendezvous with Rama is perhaps the defining example of the alien artifact trope, sometimes flippantly referred to as a BDO for Big Dumb Object. A BDO is a mysterious alien object, usually a megastructure of some sort, that is found in space and explored by humans. It's dumb in the sense of being non-communicative, unresponsive, or at least its communication is inscrutable and not really understood by the humans. As often as not, it's simply derelict. Rama isn't the first example. Ringworld certainly qualifies. For that matter, so does the Jupiter-slash-Saturn monolith in 2001. But Rama is the kind of thing a lot of people think of for a BDO. More on that trope in general in the next episode. The story goes that in the early 22nd century, a strange object is spotted entering the solar system on an interstellar trajectory. It's named Rama because it's initially mistaken for an asteroid and named after a Hindu god. But it's soon clear that it's something stranger. It's a perfect cylinder, for one. It's huge. 50 kilometers long by 20 wide, that is, 30 miles by 12 miles. It rotates once every four minutes, fast enough to produce artificial gravity on its interior walls. And it's moving blisteringly fast, nearly 300 kilometers per second, faster than the vast majority of stars in our neighborhood move relative to each other. In fact, it's so fast that only one ship is able to reach it before it leaves the solar system and even that only by a bucket brigade of refueling that leaves three other ships stranded waiting for resupply from Earth. That ship is the Endeavour, under Commander Bill Norton. The Endeavour reaches Rama, but with only three weeks to spare before it flies too close to the sun and they have to back off, placing their exploration on a strict time limit. They finally get to Rama, and inside the cylindrical shell, they find a bizarre place an environment with artificial gravity and a breathable atmosphere, a miniature sea around its equator, and dotted with structures that look like whole cities. The interior surface is nearly as large as Rhode Island, after all. All of it in deep freeze, but thawing out as it nears the sun. The creators of Rama were of course called the Ramans, which has nothing to do with ramen noodles or the flying spaghetti monster. It's a Hindu god, remember? However, they are strangely absent. The massive ship appears to be uninhabited by intelligent life, while maintenance is performed by legions of robots made from living tissues, which Clark terms biots. 
even though the original notion of robots were of biological constructs. Many of them have three-sided symmetry, which seems to be a hallmark of Raman construction, and perhaps even the Ramans themselves, although the explorers never fully understand them. Long story short, it's a lot of fun. More than you would think for a story that's pretty much all about exploring a giant derelict alien ship. And there's a lot of really good science in there, too. Now, I should mention that there is a sequel to Rendezvous with Rama. In fact, a sequel trilogy. However, the sequels were not solely Clark's, and frankly, they suffered for it. In fact, I'm going to issue one of my rare anti-recommendations for the Rama sequel trilogy. You'll thank me if you just skip them. You see, in his later years, Clark began co-writing books, starting with Cradle, which was co-written by Gentry Lee in 1988. He still wrote a few more on his own, but 12 of his last 15 novels were co-written by various people. The Rama sequel trilogy was also co-written by Gentry Lee. And by co-written, I mean Lee actually wrote most of it. Clark explained his rationale in the foreword to Rama 2. First, the rationale for having a sequel in the first place, because, believe it or not, it was not planned. In the foreword, he writes, quote, Fifteen years earlier, the very last sentence of Rendezvous with Rama had read, The Ramans do everything in threes. Now, those words were a last-minute afterthought when I was doing the final revision. I had not, cross my heart, any idea of a sequel in mind. It just seemed the correct, open-ended way of finishing the book. In real life, of course, no story ever ends. Unquote. So that was his reason for writing the book. But in the actual composition, he was happy to take a back seat. A few paragraphs later, he includes this line, which I've always related to as a writer. Quote, Even a solitary writer can think of endless excuses for not working. With two, the possibilities are at least squared. Unquote. Although, to be honest, I relate more to the first half of that. While two people can think of more excuses for goofing off, collaboration also breeds accountability. However, whatever the reason, it's believed that Lee did most of the writing on the sequel trilogy, and Lee's influence is not good. How bad is it? For starters, the sequels are peppered with sexual content that is very much not typical of Clark, and a lot of problematic social commentary that might have been acceptable in the early 90s, but I find fairly offensive today. There's some messed up stuff regarding race and politics, some even more messed up stuff regarding sex and relationships, and a totally ham-fisted allegory for the AIDS epidemic. In fact, it's not even an allegory, it's just AIDS by another name. Plus, they completely botched both genetics and child development in ways that really do matter as plot points. And they completely rewrote the lore and removed a lot of the mystery. Bottom line, definitely check out the original Rendezvous with Rama, but, like The Matrix, the sequels do not exist. But there was more to Clark's later work than Rama. Another of his classic works from this time period was The Fountains of Paradise, published in 1979. The Fountains of Paradise is a story about one man's quest to build a space elevator, an idea that Clark had first suggested many years earlier, but this was his first time writing about it in detail. The story is set in a fictionalized version of Clark's adopted home of Sri Lanka, which goes by the name the ancient Greeks knew it by, Taprobini. It's fictionalized mainly in that it's placed about 600 kilometers or 400 miles farther south, straddling the equator. Otherwise, it's very much steeped in real Sri Lankan history and culture, and includes many flashbacks to a parallel story about a legendary king of the island. Honestly, The Fountains of Paradise is another book that has problematic implications today, although this time it's more accidental. The major conflict in the first half of the book stems from the fact that, due to the vagaries of geography, the only place on Earth where they can build the space elevator is on top of the highest mountain in Taprobini. The problem with this is that there's an ancient and historic Buddhist monastery on top of the mountain, and the monks there have a pretty good case for not being displaced by this colonialist project. The issue is still working its way through the world court, and it looks like it's actually going to go badly for the Buddhist monks. But Clark actually uses a cop-out here, where a defender of the monastery accidentally creates a circumstance that the monks take as a sign that they're supposed to leave. That was pretty jarring when I read it. I'm not sure how I would have written it today, but it definitely wouldn't be like that. 
And it's all the more jarring because The Fountains of Paradise closely parallels a real-world controversy that is still in play today. Namely, the construction of the proposed 30-meter telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Here again, we have a major construction project, one of great scientific importance, where there has been significant political investment, but it's on top of a mountain that is considered sacred by the native population. And many astronomers would argue that there's no other place on American soil that would be worth the cost to build it, although your mileage may vary. My personal opinion is that it's a lot more important to make sure that it's built in the Northern Hemisphere. And now I'm over my politics quota for the episode. Now, if we're talking about Arthur Clarke's later work, we have to talk about the Space Odyssey sequels. These were mostly pretty good in my opinion, the largest drawback being the titles. Clarke apparently thought the naming scheme he had going was so good that he gave them the terribly unoriginal names of 2010 Odyssey 2, 2061 Odyssey 3, and 3001 The Final Odyssey. Incidentally, 2010 did get its own movie. I've mentioned before that 3001 was the last book Clark wrote solo in 1997, although he kept producing notable co-written titles after that. The interesting thing about the Space Odyssey series is that none of the books are direct sequels of each other. They're close, but they don't exactly take place in the same fictional universe. Clark referred to this as variations on a theme. The earlier books have always stayed in print in their original forms, but in the later ones, he retconned the backstory far more than most writers would dare, and embraced the changes he was making to the continuity. Which, I suppose, is the same thing I just criticized him and Lee for doing in the Rama sequels, but the Space Odyssey books do it a lot better. For starters, Clark moved the sequels from Saturn back to Kubrick's Jupiter, in large part so he could explore the speculative life developing in Jupiter's atmosphere and under the ice of Europa. There are other changes, too. Dave Bowman morphs from the mystical star child being to something more like a digital construct acting as a projection of the monoliths. An epilogue to 2010 entitled 20,001 is completely hand waved away, and the plot points suggested by the epilogue to 2061 are heavily reworked. In the last book, the entire timeline is vaguely shifted forward a couple decades to conform better to real world developments up to 1997. And most unusually, The monoliths are rewritten from being wormhole gates with supernatural powers to giant computers that can be damaged and hacked and are suddenly subject to the light speed limit for communication. In other words, the story gets more down to earth by the end, no pun intended. I wouldn't say all the changes are good, but they work on the whole. In brief, 2010 tells of a joint Russian and American expedition to Jupiter to recover the derelict discovery and to try to investigate the monolith a second time. This was quite the feat, considering Clark was assuming the Soviet Union would still be around. However, the monoliths have turned their attention to Europa. They have found intelligent life under the ice, and they want to uplift it like they did with humans millions of years ago. To do this, they cause Jupiter to collapse into a miniature sun to melt the ice and create dry land for them to live on. They also give a warning to the humans through the fairly famous quote, All these worlds are yours, except Europa. Attempt no landing there. The movie, taking a slightly more political bent, added the line, Use them together, use them in peace. The choice of 2061 for the third book was a very deliberate one. Clark originally planned to write it in response to the Galileo mission to Jupiter, but that was delayed by the space shuttle Challenger disaster, so he had to revise his plan. Writing in 1986, during the passage of Halley's Comet, he decided to set the book in 2061, the next time the comet would approach the sun. The story tells the tale of an expedition from a now habitable Ganymede to Halley's Comet, and then to rescue another ship that was hijacked and crashed on Europa in violation of the monolith's order. 3001 sees the return of Frank Poole, Bowman's co-pilot who was killed by Hal back in 2001. A thousand years later, his body is found floating near Neptune, And, because he was flash-frozen in the vacuum of space, their future medical technology is able to revive him. Much of the story takes place inside a giant tower of a space elevator. However, the main conflict comes when the monolith receives orders from up the chain, orders that are a thousand years out of date, that the humans are too dangerous to let live. 
although I liked that book mainly because it let Clark indulge in showing off some super futuristic new technology that he doesn't get too much with his usual hard sci-fi fare. Those are all of Clark's really famous books from his later years, but there's one more that deserves a mention, The Songs of Distant Earth, which Clark said was his favorite of all his books. The Songs of Distant Earth was originally a novelette published in If Magazine in 1958, but he updated it and expanded it into a novel in 1986, something he also did with The Light of Other Days in 2000, co-writing with Stephen Baxter, but this one was a solo work. In the universe of The Songs of Distant Earth, sometime around the year 3600, Earth was destroyed. Clark envisions a solution to the solar neutrino problem, unsolved at the time of writing, that the sun was out of balance and would eventually go nova, destroying the solar system. Today, of course, we know that the missing neutrinos simply change into a different type that's harder to detect. The planet Thalassa is an ocean world housing a human colony, established long ago by an embryo-carrying seed ship. The Thalassans are an idyllic, but also somewhat idle people, where polyamory is the norm, war and religion are virtually unknown, and there is a civilization-wide tendency to procrastination. As a result of that last one, they lost contact with Earth before its destruction, so they are completely blindsided when a massive arc ship carrying a million of the last humans in suspended animation shows up out of the blue. The ship is only there to refuel, on its way to found a new colony, but a few crew members are awakened and come down to work with the Thalassans on the process. There's culture shock and love and loss and... Look, there's a lot going on here, and I'm not the best person to make the case for it. I did read the book, but I feel like I wasn't old enough to appreciate it at the time, and I didn't find it very interesting. And indeed, this is Clark at his most philosophical, filled with far-reaching ideas about religion, apocalypse, utopia, the transient nature of existence, and of course the long-term implications of interstellar travel. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about it. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available on Libsyn, SoundCloud, Spotify, etc., etc. You know the drill. Hey, as much as I appreciate Libsyn for hosting, I mainly listen to podcasts on YouTube, where you can also find this podcast, and you can find all of my writings on my own website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for the episode is Rendezvous with Rama, as if there were any other choice. This is one of those classics that frequently ranks in top 20 or even top 10 lists, and it's really its own brand of strange new world sci-fi. I really couldn't go with anything else. In the next episode, it's time for another interview. This time, I'm interviewing Daniel M. Benson, author of Junction and First Knife, which I've previously reviewed on my blog. This one is for the occasion of his next novel, Interchange, which releases the day after the interview airs. So be sure to check that one out right away. Thanks for listening.